Not bad at all. Thanks again and good evening. First tonight, a story that will shock many viewers, one that involves a former South Australian career criminal turned police informant who had incriminating evidence planted on him. Now, when Brian Stanton went to the police station to expose a gang of thieves and drug dealers on the south coast, he thought he would be welcomed with open arms. But it was Brian who ended up on the wrong side of the law. Paul Macon documents his four-year battle for justice and raises the questions, who set him up and why? It has been a form of mental, emotional and physical torture. Who planted it? I wonder who put it there. Well, fingerprint. You are under The police tried to cover up the failings of some police officers in this investigation. DNA test again. We're just doing our job. Oh, I put my life on the line on numerous occasions for absolutely less than nothing. This is the story of an Adelaide court case alleging police misconduct, drug dealing, theft of weapons and perhaps even murder. It's serious. I know a lot more serious stuff. I've over the years come into contact with lots and lots of serious stuff. I was uh, in my day of a fairly serious criminal. When Brian Stanton came to us many years ago, he had an extraordinary tale to tell. He was an underbelly style criminal turned police informant. It sounds ridiculous. And I understand that the public, I mean the public would no doubt think that it, 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 it just couldn't possibly be true. But I know to be a fact who controls the drug scene. I know who controls prostitution. I know who controls organised crime um, and it is not who the general population think it is. He says in 2001 he was set up with a drug charge because he'd trodden on the wrong toes. It was a square up. It was a square up because I gave the crop up. I gave, I gave the $20 million crop up. I was the only man to go to jail. So when he turned up five years ago to tell us he'd again given more information to police, we were a bit sceptical. If you were so concerned about how the police were operating, why did you go back to them this last time? Look, I mean, we, we spoke of this and, and I totally agree. It was, it was without a doubt I've made a lot of foolish decisions along the way. This will go down in my history as one of the greatest mistakes of, of judgment that I've made in my lifetime. His tip-off was over a criminal syndicate based at a rural property in the Goolwa Victor Harbour area. According to Brian, they were into everything, using a tree lopping business as a front to case rural properties to raid. There was stolen property being stored there, there was firearms being stored there. I was led to believe that there's a couple of bodies down the back of the joint. Brian knew all this because he'd worked with the horses on the property and was trusted. And of course they were aware of my past and they wanted me to be involved. I didn't want to be involved. The fact is it wasn't the first time we'd heard such stories. Around 2008 property owner Lorraine came to us about suspicious activities at a neighbouring farm. And most times I'm fearing for my life, you know. They've been um, firing shots at me, the police wouldn't come. The threats and harassment intensified after she reported police may have been involved. The police car would be frequently down there and the police would be lounging on the bonnet and they'd be having a good old laughy time and they would be there for, you know, up to an hour. Our attempts to investigate were blocked by police and our camera confiscated. So when Brian claimed the crims he knew of had links to police, we couldn't help but be a little curious. And I went to a country police station. I thought that's going to be different than dealing with these clowns in this. It was no different. A year later, he came back with an even more disturbing story. He'd been arrested and charged with being in possession of a stolen sawn-off shotgun, loaded and ready to fire. 
I was, I knew I was in a bit of trouble at this stage of the game, Paul. Yeah, I'd been, yeah, hung out to dry. Brian believed he'd been set up again. But who was going to believe this self-confessed crim with a rap sheet as long as your arm? Arm robbery, abductions, bashings, shootings. Nevertheless, he insisted he'd since turned his life around. An ex-cop Paul Williams was prepared to vouch for that. What you see is what you get. Honest, loyal. Uh, he does have integrity. Integrity that I find lacking in a lot of other people. And Brian was prepared to prove it by fighting the charge in court. What you'll hear is what the jury heard. For the truth to come out. And, and not just the truth about my matter. Because keep this in mind, I'm not the only person in South Australia, but I'm not the only person this happens to. The dramatic sequence of events took place in September 2009, when Brian contacted Victor Harbour Police to set up a meeting to blow the whistle on the corruption in the area. I saw young girls ranging in age, I would say, could have been as young as 12, up to 17 being taken in and out of rooms by older men. Um, there, there, there were drugs being, being sold from the property. It, it was a despicable, and this is on this, a, a little retirement town on the south coast of, of South Australia. He was picked up by police and taken to Victor Harbour Police Station to meet with relieving detective Elizabeth Mascaro in the presence of a uniformed officer. While Elizabeth Mascaro took notes, Brian Stanton's only stipulation was they not alert any of the suspect officers. One in particular, this man, Constable David Cousins, who himself has an unenviable record, having a town up in arms over heavy-handed policing. What gives anyone the right to approach and deal with ordinary people in a rude, arrogant, intimidating and sometimes frightening manner. And in another serious incident, forcing Saypol to cough up $15,000 in hush money to stop his police brutality case seeing the light of day. I mentioned several times, under no circumstances was David Cousins to be made aware that this investigation was going on. What happened just two nights later in the Gulwa Hotel involving the same constable, David Cousins, justified his concerns. Constable David Cousins walked through the door. He made a beeline for me and uh, said to me, Brian, I'd uh, like to talk to you. And I said to him, well, can talk to me. And um, he said, I'd prefer if you came outside. I went outside with him. Cousins was met by two uniformed officers, one with a video camera. So the video camera's up? Video camera's up. Cousins then asked him for the car keys. I told him that you don't need them, you can't, passenger side door cannot be locked. He opened the passenger side door of the motor vehicle, reached directly to the underside of the passenger seat and produced a, a half sawn off shotgun. The shotgun was loaded and still had the serial number intact, but Cousins hadn't finished. Reached over the seat and grabbed the barrel and handed him the barrel. The barrel just laying on the back seat. Ludicrous. As Brian told the court, no experienced criminal would run such a risk, nor do such an amateurish job. I mean, the stock was on it. You can cut a shotgun down to be... You can put it down your pants. And I would suggest if you're going to cut a weapon down, you're cutting it down to conceal it, to make it a concealable weapon. It was planted. It was planted there by somebody. To appreciate just how dubious all of this was, the jury was taken through what took place between Brian's first meeting at Victor Harbour Police Station and his arrest. Elizabeth Mascaro's notes were typed up and handed to her superior officer. The next day I received a phone call from a detective at Victor Harbour wanting to set up a meeting. The chosen location was a secluded country track where Brian says he repeated the same info. Well, that's interesting to us as well. 
so you know yourself. And you also made a phone call. Now, you made a phone call to a particular person... I did. ..you believe was a criminal. I knew it was a criminal. Yeah. And they listened to that phone call on the speaker? They, oh, I put it on speakerphone and they listened to the entire phone call. You've still got it? The call was about the sale of a stolen semi-automatic weapon with a silencer and police body armour. And so, having established his bona fides, Brian was told... Go back there, continue my association with these people, and uh, they would go away and talk to their superiors. If the job was to be a goer, I would be texted a phone number that afternoon. Oddly enough, in court, the senior detective appeared to have little recall of this crucial meeting or the incriminating phone call about the weapons. Who was it from? I don't know. But it was about guns, wasn't it? That's what the conversation was about. I don't recall any conversation about a gun. Or Brian's need for confidentiality. You can understand that someone in Mr Stanton's position might raise with you that you weren't to talk to anyone about anything he told you. I don't remember the specifics of a conversation like that. After they parted company, Brian was text the phone number promised. The sting was on. He was to go to the Goolwa Hotel and set up the sale. But who should show up but Constable Cousins? And Brian was in his sights. What was wrong with that picture? What was wrong with that? Well, there was never a search. What was wrong with that picture was that police officer knew where those two items were before he ever opened the door of that car. But as the jury heard, just about everything to do with the arrest was suspect. The first words I utter to David Cousins when he produces that sawn-off shotgun are these. Fingerprint the f***ing thing. It's not mine. Two policemen, without gloves, although they've got gloves in the police in car... In the cars. ..are handling this shotgun. And shells. Yeah. Because they've been pulled out of it at this stage. With their bare hands. With their bare hands. David Cousins' cavalier approach to proper processes hasn't improved, storing Exhibit A in his police car boot and carrying it into court. But his credibility took a further dive in the witness box. Police department protocol is that you're not meant to handle exhibits without gloves on. Not entirely. You're not meant to, are you? That's correct. Where did you find the barrel, the sawn-off barrel? At the scene in Cadell Street. So you contaminated that as well? I handled that as well, yes. And the video of the arrest brought to court was useless. So the tape you've got there isn't a proper video of what you filmed because it malfunctioned? That's correct. When was it that you discovered that the tape had malfunctioned? When I came back to the police station at about 1am in the morning. Nor did David Cousins seek any alternative. I didn't see CCTV from the hotel, no. Did you ask? No, I haven't. Brian knew he was really on his own when he rang that emergency number he'd been texted by police earlier in the day. The officer at the other end said... I'm sorry, Brian, but I've been instructed from above to have no further contact with you. They immediately searched his property for stolen goods, but found nothing. Yet it took them another six days before they got around to searching the property he'd tipped them off about. And sure enough, they found loot from a recent break-in. It took four years to come to trial, and when it did, Brian took the extraordinary step of putting his record before the jury right from the start. I admit that I've got an horrific criminal history, but I threw that on the table because I wanted those people to know that that is what was and this is what is now.